I've been talking about economic globalization, the closer integration of the countries of the world. But the countries of the world have become more interdependent in other ways, and most importantly, in the fact that we share a common atmosphere, a common environment. And just like we have to learn how to live together to make our global economy work, we have to learn to live together to make, to share this global environment. The world has been engaged in an experiment. We've been pouring greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane in, into the atmosphere at an unprecedented pace. The scientists are fairly sure that they know what's going to happen. The earth will get warmer, water levels in the sea will rise. It is an experiment of enormous consequences. We don't have a lot of different planets that we can go to. If the experiment fails, we have no other place to go. This is the one earth that we have. And that's why this experiment is one that is so risky, an experiment that we should stop. Let me try to explain the nature of global warming. It's a complex science, but the basic, basic ideas are fairly simple. It's called greenhouse gases because of the way greenhouses work. Energy from the sun enters into the greenhouse, gets trapped, when you want to grow vegetables or flowers, the extra heat makes them grow faster, which is great. The greenhouse gases act in very much the same way. They trap energy from the sun as it enters into the earth, so it can't escape. And as that energy gets trapped, the earth gets warmer and warmer. Actually, the increase in the temperature is relatively slight couple of degrees, but a couple of degrees can make an enormous difference. As the earth gets warmer, water expands, carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the ocean, and sea levels will rise. Countries, small islands in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, will become, go underwater. The Maldives, just recently devastated by the tsunami, is debating about reconstruction because they, they worry that within 50 years they will be underwater. Our own 21st century Atlantis. A third of Bangladesh will become submerged. This poor, poor country People crowded together, incomes as a result only slightly above subsistence, will become even poorer. Now some people say, well, there are positive benefits as well as costs. For instance, one of the effects that we're already seeing is the polar ice cap has been melting. And this melting of the polar ice cap is one of the factors that is contributing to the rising of the sea level. I was at a meeting in Davos last year when several of representatives of the oil companies talked about the new opportunities that this meant. It would be easier to drill for oil underneath, underneath the Arctic Ocean now that the polar ice cap wasn't there. Of course, there were some problems about who, to whom did the oil belong, and one could see a certain amount of conflict. But the basic problem, uh, they saw this as an opportunity not a problem. But of course it was an opportunity that will mean more global warming, enhancing the pace. So what we know is that the world will be facing an enormous amount of uncertainty. It is an experiment that is extremely risky. Following the scientific findings, the world got together and decided something had to be done. At Kyoto in 1997, countries of the world agreed that they would reduce the level of emissions of these greenhouse gases. Their target was to reduce them below the levels that they had been at 1990. 
they realized that the burden on developing countries would not be acceptable. And so they were exempted for the time being. And focus was on the advanced industrial countries. That agreement that was made in 1997 has now been ratified by more than 50% of the countries of the world that contribute to the pollution. And the treaty has gone into effect. But there are several problems. The first is that the United States has refused to go along. The United States is the world's largest polluter, is contributing over 20% of the greenhouse gases. The level of greenhouse gas emissions from the United States is larger than that of dozens of countries put together from the developing world. The second problem is that developing countries have not really signed on. And they will play an increasingly important role in contributing to pollution. Within 25 years, they will be contributing more than 50% of the pollution. And unless they are brought along, the level of pollution will not be able to control, be controlled. The third problem is enforcement. Even after they sign, how do we make sure that countries comply? These are the three questions I want to talk about this afternoon. First, I want to talk, though, about what is the underlying economics that is leading to the problem of emissions, a problem from which the whole world will suffer unless something is done. Just as the physical scientists have come to understand the nature of the underlying physical forces that cause global warming, economists have understood the underlying economic forces. And it's really very simple. It's pro called the problem of the commons. In fact, some people call it the tragedy of the commons. If you have a common resource from which anybody can take without paying the cost, there's a temptation to do that. Yeah, the commons, the problem of commons was first recognized in the context, for instance, of the commons in, in UK and England, Scotland, where people would put out their sheep to graze in the commons. And more and more people would put out their sheep into the commons. And as the more and more of them uh, grazed, there would be less and less grass. And each sheep subtracted from what was available to the others. And there could be so many sheep that the total well-being was undermined. We call that an externality. Each sheep, each person, as he put more sheep, reduced the amount of grazing that was available to others exactly the same problem with our common atmosphere. Everybody takes it for granted as a common good. They all add their emissions, not thinking about what would happen if everybody did the same thing that they're doing. So each pollutes, and as each pollutes, the quality of the environment goes down. The greenhouse gas concentrations increase, and we face the problem of global warming. The world has faced these problems before, countries have faced these problems before, and have figured out ways of dealing with them. There are, in fact, two broad ways. The problem of the commons in England and Scotland in the 16th, 17th century was solved by privatization. You took the commons and put it into private hands. Of course, that made the people who were previously putting, the ordinary people who were putting their, their sheep out to the commons much worse off. But it did result in efficiency. But no one is talking about the idea of privatizing the atmosphere. It's just an idea that is completely irrelevant. And that means that we're forced on the alternative way, which is regulation. In one way or another, we will have to learn how to regulate the emissions. Regulations can take a variety of forms, limitations on the amount of, of pollution, charging people for polluting. There are a variety of ways in which these regulations can work. But one way or another, we will have to make sure that the level of emissions is reduced. Now, why is it that the United States, the richest country in the world, refuses to go along? 
When President Bush became the president, he said, at first, he said there wasn't enough evidence, there wasn't enough certainty. Well, of course there's always uncertainty, but the weight of evidence was overwhelming. And this is an experiment. If things come out badly, we all will face a calamity. If it turns out that we are overly cautious, we cut back on our greenhouse gas emissions, we protect the environment a little bit better than we need, the cost is minuscule. So here we're engaged in a one-sided bet. So the fact that there is uncertainty is no excuse. In fact, after he said the scientific evidence was not strong enough, he instructed America's National Academy of Science to look at the evidence, and they came out with the only answer that they could have come out with. They came out with the same re result that every other Academy of Science that's looked at the data has, has come out with, and that is global warming is a problem. Global warming has, is being caused, or at least is partly caused, by the increases in the greenhouse gases and that we can do something about that by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. The second thing that the United States has said is that it's too expensive. This is nonsense. Clearly, if the United, other countries can afford to reduce their emissions, so can the United States. There are countries like France, Japan, other countries around the world with just as high a standard of living that are polluting one-half, one-third as much as the United States. So one can live just as well and pollute much, much less. America's standard of living is not in jeopardy were to go along with the agreement that every other country, the other advanced industrial countries have agreed to. The third argument that they put forward is that unless the developing countries go along, it will be a meaningless gesture. And here, they're partly right. As I said, within 25, 30 years, the developing countries will be contributing half or more of the greenhouse gas emissions. And so it is imperative to bring them along. But they won't be brought along unless the world's largest polluter, the United States, also reduces its pollution. And this brings us to one of the central problems, one, the key issue which I think has led to the impasse in the global debate. The developing countries say the current problems of global warming have really been caused by the advanced industrial countries. They are the ones that are responsible for the enormous increase in concentrations of greenhouse gases. They can afford it. The, the poor countries do not have the resources, do not have the ability. If they spend money reducing their pollution, they'll have less money to, to grow, to, to lift their people out of poverty. Whereas what is at stake in the, in the context of the United States is not a question of lifting people out of poverty. It's whether the United States continues with its energy profligate, its emissions profligate lifestyle. And for them, there's absolutely no comparison. To put it another way, what they say is, why should the United States, simply because it's polluted more in the past, be entitled to pollute more in the future? If the developing countries and the developed countries had the same level of pollution per capita, then the developing countries will not face constraints for decades to come. The per capita emissions of the United States is so much greater than that of the developing countries that the developing countries can continue to pollute and still for decades to come without reaching the emissions per capita level of the United States. The United States retorts by saying our level of emissions per GDP is lower than developing countries, and that's what's relevant. Now, it is true that poor countries have less efficient technology 
And the result of that is they often emit more pollution per unit GDP. But to say that you're allowed to emit more because your GDP is more is to say that richer countries should be allowed to emit more. And for the developing countries, this is totally unacceptable. The result of this is that the world today faces an impasse. The United States, the world's largest polluter, refuses to do anything unless the developing countries do something. The developing countries say, unless the United States reduces its emissions enormously, why should they do anything? And if they're allowed to emit the same amount per capita as the United States, they will be unconstrained for years to come. But the problem of global warming is too important to let this kind of feud between the developing and the developed world, world let us all suffer as we dispute one with the other. The advanced industrial countries put aside their disagreements, put aside the differences. Norway, for instance, is in a very different situation from France and different situation from other countries. Norway depends mostly on hydroelectric power and so is not emitting as much pollution. France has moved to nuclear power and again is not emitting as much. For these countries, it may be much more difficult to reduce their emissions. And a framework was, made, uh, was developed in which an agreement was reached among countries of very differing circumstances. And so if there is goodwill, it is possible to reach an agreement. I want to talk about several ways in which we can, I think, reach an agreement and solve these three problems of how to bring the United States along, how to bring the developing countries along, and how to make sure that we bring in all the sources of pollution. Let me begin by talking about the third problem, the variety of sources of pollution. What we focused on mostly at Kyoto was the problem of, of few, burning coal, oil, fossil fuels, and the emissions that that resulted. But there's another source of increasing increases of greenhouse gas, gases, and that has to do with deforestation. Trees do two things. On the one hand, when they're, they're alive, their they're forests are able to convert carbon dioxide back into oxygen. So they, in a sense, clean the atmosphere. They convert greenhouse gases into oxygen. Secondly, they store carbon. When forests are cut down, just the opposite happens. They're not there to clean the atmosphere, and the process of deforestation leads to carbon being emitted into the atmosphere. This process of deforestation has been adding, actually, large amounts to carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Estimate about 20% of the increase in carbon concentration is due to deforestation. So deforestation is roughly the same size in its contribution as the United States. Deforestation in two countries alone, Brazil and Indonesia, will undo something like 80% of the advances that Europe and other countries that signed the Kyoto Protocol have made in reducing their emission levels. So this is a major problem. Kyoto, however, made a significant mistake. They focused on the emissions from burning, from, from automobiles, from houses, from heating, from air conditioning, the various sources of energy, but they didn't focus on deforestation. Countries were given credit if they planted forest, they called it carbon sequestration, but nothing was done to encourage countries not to engage in deforestation.
So in fact, you have this anomalous situation where a country would be better off cutting down its forest and replanting it. Of course, that makes no economic sense. Recently, a group of countries called the Rainforest Coalition, countries, uh, tropical countries, uh, have these rich rainforests, have gotten together and made an extremely interesting proposal. They have said, we will preserve our rainforest if you can give us credit for doing so. The developing countries are making an enormous contribution to the global environment in several ways. Not only are they contributing by maintaining these forests to reducing the level of carbon in the atmosphere, but they're also, these forests serve to preserve biodiversity. Biodiversity is very important as a source of new drugs, new plants, very important so important, in fact, that there was an international agreement, international convention on maintaining biodiversity. But again, to, for the most part, developing countries are not being compensated for providing these services for the entire global community. We talk all the time about providing incentives. But unfortunately, we are not providing the developing countries with the incentives to use their land most efficiently. For many of these developing countries, the most efficient use of, the, of their land is to maintain the rainforest, efficient from the point of view of the world as a whole. But they don't have the incentive to do that under current arrangements. And they are too poor just to make a contribution to global well-being. They would like to do it. They're only asking for getting compensation. Now, part of the Kyoto Protocol, the Kyoto Agreement, was a provision that countries that polluted a little bit more than they were allowed to could offset that by buying credits, as they were called, from people who polluted a little bit less. They're called offsets creating, in effect, a market. You can call it a market for pollution. And there is a trading, a European trading system, where people are buying and selling these pollution permits. So everybody is given a certain amount of pollution that they're allowed, and those who, who are more efficient can sell their greater efforts in reducing pollution to those who have greater difficulty in reducing pollution. So the notion here is that the developing countries, the tropical countries that are able to maintain their forests would be provided with incentives to do that by selling their, their, their credits to those who are finding it difficult to meet their targets. This is important not only for the global environment, it's also extremely important for the development. The amounts of money we're talking about are large. Countries like the Costa Rica, a number of the Africa countries, Papua New Guinea, got compensated appropriately for their environmental services. They would be receiving billions and billions of dollars. In fact, the amount of the value of their environmental services for which they are currently not being compensated exceeds the value of the foreign aid that they are receiving today. So providing this money could make an enormous difference to their development. So we could, at the same time, protect the global environment and promote the development of some of the poorest countries in the world. The harder question is, how do we get enforcement? Assume that we could get the developing countries to go along. Assume that we could get the United States to go along. How can we enforce any agreement that is reached. Destroying the global environment deserves sanctions. The United States actually recognized the principle. A number of years ago, it brought a case against Thailand. It said that 
it wanted to bar shrimp that Thailand caught in nets that were killing turtles, endangered species of turtles, it wanted to bar those shrimp from the United States. It said that there's a global environmental importance of, of maintaining uh, these endangered species, or these turtles, and that that was sufficiently important that they could keep out these shrimp that were caught in these turtle and friendly way. The WTO agreed. The WTO, there was some disagreement about the exact way things were done, but the general principle was that these global environmental benefits are sufficiently strong that if any country violates international principles, sanctions could be imposed. And the United States was allowed, in effect, to go ahead with this barring of shrimp caught in these turtle and friendly necks. But if it's important, if, if, if preserving sh turtles is important, preserving the atmosphere that we all live, that we all depend on, is even more important. We can look at the issue in a somewhat different way. The WTO, the World Trading Organization, is supposed to create a level playing field, a level playing field in which countries can compete on fair terms. But currently, there's a basic source of unfairness. Countries are not allowed to subsidize. That was one of the important parts of the Uruguay Round, the trade agreement that was signed in 1994. But in effect, allowing a company to pollute the atmosphere is a hitting subsidy. Europe, Japan, have said they're not going to allow their, con their uh, uh, firms in their country, households in their country, to pollute. They are restrictions on the emissions. That was the whole point of the Kyoto Protocol. If you pollute, you, have, you, you, you face certain consequences. But American firms are allowed to pollute. As a result, they face low energy prices, and this is, should be viewed clearly as unfair competition. And so Europe and Japan, it seems to me, should use the precedent of the shrimp turtle case, which the United States brought before the WTO, and say, your America's allowing companies to pollute is an unfair trade subsidy, a hidden subsidy of significant magnitude, and should be allowed to bar or to impose a tariff particularly on energy-intensive goods, which contribute so much to the level of global emissions. This would provide incentives. As an economist, I believe incentives matter. At one point, President Bush said, let's rely on voluntary system. Let people voluntarily reduce their emissions. And let's pray that technology will solve the problem. But if you believe in the market economy, you don't believe in just prayer. You don't believe that uh, innovation comes out of nowhere. Prices provide incentives. The fact that people have to pay for their pollution will provide incentives for people not to pollute. It will provide incentives for researchers to come up with new products, new ways of producing that are less emission, that, that emit less and that preserve our environment. So what is at stake is, can we provide incentives for the United States to go along with what is clearly a global concern and global consequences? The United States may not intend to hurt Bangladesh and the people there. It may not intend to force them to have to flee their homes, it may not intend to have a third of Bangladesh be underwater may not intend for the Maldives to disappear. But the consequences of the missions of the United States and others who are continuing to emit is precisely that. They are doing more damage than any war could possibly have done.
And so they have to be provided with incentives if they don't voluntarily go along. That brings me to the third and perhaps the most difficult problem. How can we reach a global consensus about how do we balance the interest of the United States, the interest of the developing countries? One that says we ought to have allow a certain emissions per capita. The other says we ought to have a certain emissions per unit of GDP. These two principles have enormously different consequences. And there seems at this point no way we can bring the two together. Well, there's another framework that we can use. And the basic framework is the following. There is a social cost to pollution. We can make people pay for that social cost. In other words, pollution is an externality. It's a cost that is imposed on others. And if you make people pay for the cost that they impose on others, you can correct this failure of the market. You can provide incentives for people to economize, for people not to pollute. We use this kind of principle in many other contexts, people making people pay for the cost that they impose on society. The Kyoto framework was a natural one. There was a problem. People were polluting too much. And the response was, let's reduce the amount of pollution by telling everybody to reduce the level of pollution that they were contributing. The problem is the difficulty of reaching agreement about how much each should reduce. The market provides an easy way of dealing with the problem. We'll make everybody pay for the cost, the marginal cost of that they impose on others. And so the international agreement would be that everybody would force, every country would force their firms and their households to pay for the cost of pollution. Now, ideally, they could use that revenue to fund global public goods. The revenues, enormous revenues, could be used to, to finance uh, research, to finance global uh, needs in the area in a whole variety of areas, including the cost of improving the environment, research. But that may not be possible. And a more conservative approach would just say, let each country keep the money themselves. In other words, they could use the tax, the penalty that people pay for emissions as a source of revenue, reducing other taxes. And this is consistent with a general principle in economics. It makes a lot more sense to tax bad things, like pollution, than to tax labor or savings, which are good things. And so if you switched from taxing work and taxing savings to taxing pollution, overall well-being would actually be enhanced. We would do less of the bad things and more of the good things and societal well-being would be, societies would be better off. So in this way, by, by focusing on this tax on pollution, we could actually make most countries of the world better off. Developing countries would be particularly better off because for them, the, many of them face a very inefficient in their use of energy. And so they could both conserve on energy at the same time that they were contributing to addressing the problem of global warming. If everybody benefits from this, why haven't we done it? What's the resistance? Well, I said virtually every country in the world would benefit, but not everybody within those countries would benefit. There are some people who would be worse off. The oil companies, the coal companies, automobile companies. There are many people, special interests, that benefit from the current system. The American automobile companies like low energy prices, like low fuel prices, because they've developed these gas guzzling cars and the lower the energy prices, the better they do. They can't compete with those who've done research 
to develop more fuel-efficient cars. But I actually think that there's no reason why, if they were provided the right incentives, that they couldn't do just as well as Japanese companies and European companies that have learned how to make fuel-efficient cars. So yes, there will be resistance in the beginning, but in the end, I think even the American economy would benefit as more Americans devoted themselves to doing research, America could become one of the leaders in technologies, in, in this important area of technology. It has lagged because it hasn't had the incentive to go into these important developments. It used to be said that the environment and the economy are at loggerheads. There's opposition between the two. Environment, environmentalists were seen as anti the economy. I don't think that's the right way of looking at things. Part of the problem comes from the way we measure, gross uh, measure success. The usual measure of success is GDP, gross domestic product. But unfortunately, gross domestic product, GDP, does not take into account many things that are very important. It doesn't measure overall living standards. It doesn't measure health. Most importantly, it doesn't matter, measure the degradation to the environment. So we have instances where GDP could be going up and the country can be coming poor. It could be coming poor because the resources are being depleted because the environment is being degraded. What we measure affects what we do. And that's one of the reasons why I've been pushing very strongly, many environmentalists, for focusing on a measure called green GDP or green NNP that actually takes into account the depletion of natural resources and the degradation of the environment. When we measure GDP correctly, Many of the conflicts that we see between the environment and the economy disappear. Take the issue of emissions, uh, take the issue of pollution that I talked before. If you have incentives to reduce emissions, the quality of the atmosphere improves, life expectancy may even increase. Correctly measured, our well-being has increased. That ought to be measured as part of their economy. So by providing the right incentives, we're both economizing and we're, we're promoting incentives to do the right thing. There's no conflict between the economy and the environment. In fact, in many developing countries, if we provide the right incentives for economizing and energy, we will both promote economic growth directly, even in the incorrectly measured way, and promote a better environment. So the challenge today is both to try to get better measures that focus our attention on what is really important, not just the physical production of goods and services, but our well-being. And once we do that, we'll have better incentives to make sure that the environment and, and the economy work together it will make us better off today, but will even have benefits, greater benefits in the future.